Yes. Programming to bring you an NBC News special on the historic flight of America's first woman in space. We have main engine ignition. Four, three, two, one, zero, and liftoff. Liftoff of the Orbiter Challenger and the sixth flight of the space safe. shuttle. The shuttle. Hey, we're going out for another ride. Uh, that's going to be several trips down the road. This uh, taking off with seven million pounds of thrust under you be going uh, 17,500 miles an hour in around eight and a half minutes. Uh, there's no way that's going to get to be routine too fast. When people ask me, uh, she is a 12-hour day, 12 hour day uh, that sounds like a lot of work. It's not work, but it's fun. So you may be putting in a lot of effort, but it's not work, it's fun. There's no other job I'd rather have, and I don't know of any other job that uh, really brings into play my background more than this one does. There's, there's no job where I could do and use all of the things uh, in my background so much as this one. But uh, the, the job of preparing to fly in space is fantastic, and I, and I think that flying in space is going to be even better, so how can I trade that in? So we've been through almost all the training that we need, and although there are a few last-minute preparations and last-minute details to get down, we're, we're ready. Main engine throttle is going back to 104 percent. Challenger is... And this is it. We're ready and waiting to hear that go for launch at Cape Canaveral, Florida, as the Space Shuttle Challenger approaches a historic flight. It is uh, by the clock, T-minus 20 minutes. We're in a 10-minute hold, and you're watching a live picture of the orbiter poised and ready on pad 39A. After six liftoffs, it's, well, it's almost commonplace except that today there is a woman on board and she's ready to take her place in history. Dr. Sally Ride, soon to become America's first woman in space. And good morning from Cape Canaveral. I'm Jane Pauley at the Kennedy Space Center with astronaut Dick Scobie. And first of all, we saw the clock say T minus 20. I said there was a 10 minute hold. How do we get from a 20 minutes by the clock to 7.33, which is our expected launch time? Well, Jane, the 20-minute uh, hold is set up to give the, the Cape people time if there's any problems in the launch countdown to take care of that kind of thing. Coming out of this 20-minute hold, they will mode the onboard computers into the, into the flight configuration. In other words, we'll go from the uh, uh, ground operation to flight operations mode, and that's what come, happens coming out of the 20-minute hold. And then we count down to nine minutes, and at nine minutes, you'll get the go for launch. Is there any turning back at that point? Yes, you can still go into holds or turn back. The, the place where it's very difficult to, to turn back the clock, if you will, is after the APUs are started at five minutes, and then we're consumables limited, and you have to do something. You either have to get it off the pad or shut down the APUs and recycle it, and that takes some time. Um, I'm looking at a magnificent dawn, but the reason it's magnificent, there's some clouds in the sky. Is this a good day for flying? Uh, it looks like a good day for flying. The clouds are breaking up, and this is kind of a normal weather pattern for the Cape. Uh, you really just need scattered clouds, and if you look out towards the shuttle landing site off to our right, then you'll see that uh, the clouds are fairly well broken up. There are a few little scattered clouds out there, but it's probably a really good day for launch. And we're going to launch in the uh, minute. Uh, now at 7.33, you saw the count has begun again. We're now T-minus 19 minutes and 33 seconds to go before launch. And it has already been a real busy day here at, at Kennedy, uh, not just for the astronauts and the support crews, but also for the crowds. Let's start the morning with the astronauts. And it was a real early breakfast this morning. With all women. All right. Wow. Yeah. The flight crew has been awakened and will be going into breakfast just a short time from now. Uh, John Fabian, the tallest of the group, once quite worried that he was just too tall to be an astronaut uh, with the rumor. And the crew leaving headquarters, uh, that uh, was 4.45 this morning. They get there in the astromobile. Now you're watching Sally Ride putting some uh, biomedical sensors on her fellow mission specialist, Fabian. Fabian and Dr. Uh, Norm Thagard will be wired for, uh, for treatment. And there is Sally Ride waving goodbye in the white room and crawling into the orbiter to find her position among the four other astronauts and uh, oh, taking her place in history. We saw that happen. That was at 5.34 this morning. So they have what? They've been in that uh, in the orbiter now for an hour and a half. Yes, and uh, if there's any kind of holds or anything, it gets rather painful laying on your back for that length of time with your head above your or below your legs. Yeah, kind of well, they're not playing cards, that's for <laughs> sure. 
Well, things do look pretty good now, 18 minutes and counting. NBC News science correspondent Bob Bazell has been monitoring the activity inside the orbiter. And he gives us a report as well on what NASA hopes to accomplish this mission. Bob? Jane, good morning. I'm over here in the press area where thousands of reporters are prepared to cover this mission. Even though this is the seventh flight of the space shuttle, it has a lot of firsts. And the crew has one of the busiest schedules they've ever had on any shuttle mission. Robert Crippen, the commander of the seventh shuttle mission, will be the first astronaut to return to space in the shuttle. He was the pilot or second in command on the first mission in April 1981. The pilot on this flight will be Navy Captain Rick Houck. Sally Ride and her fellow mission specialist John Fabian have two major tasks. On the first and second days of the mission, they will launch two commercial communication satellites, one for Canada and one for Indonesia, like this one launched on a previous shuttle flight. Then, using the shuttle's robot arm, they will release and then retrieve a West German satellite loaded with scientific experiments. This will be the first time the shuttle will retrieve an object from space. The fifth crew member is a physician, Dr. Norman Thaggard. He will be studying what NASA calls space adaptation syndrome, the motion sickness which more than half of the shuttle astronauts in the past have suffered. At the end of the six-day mission, the Challenger will land on the concrete runway here at the Kennedy Space Center the first time a space mission will return to the same place it left. And Jane, to me, that's one of the most exciting things about this mission, the fact that a spaceship will be coming back to the same place from which it left, and it means that in terms of the history of space exploration, I think that's a, that's a very big moment, that no, no more splashdowns in the ocean or out in the Siberian desert or even a landing in Air Force, in, uh, Air Force Base in California, coming right back to where they left. Jane? Thank you, Bob. And uh, we continue to wait for launch. The count now 16 minutes uh, to launch. But that uh, factor in another 10-minute hold, so it's not, uh, not literally 16 minutes. We are watching the clock for you. Um, I'm told that uh, some 100 million people will be watching this launch, uh, courtesy of NBC, some other networks. Bob Bazell over at the press site with literally hundreds of press people from not just this country, but around the world. And the reason they are here, well, let's face it, it's Dr. Sally Ride. The fact that America is putting its first woman in space has given this seventh launch of the space shuttle some particular interest. Dick, I know you aren't uh, directly responsible for Sally's publicity, but um, I know everybody at NASA has been a little overwhelmed by the interest that this one woman has generated, right? Well, it's, it's kind of like a first flight thing for, for a lady to fly the first time. It's, uh, it's unique, different, and interesting, and so therefore you generate a lot of media interest in it, and it has caused us a little in NASA a little bit of consternation because it's hard to pick and choose what Sally has to do and trade that off with her crew training and things like that. It makes it very difficult for her and she's a very noble person and handled it very well. Well, this is, this is certainly not showbiz. This is very serious business, but it's also extremely exciting. And there is a man here who has, well, he's virtually seen it all. He's not a technician. He is an artist. His name is Bob McCall. He's been sketching the space program since uh, NASA was formed in the late 50s. And you've probably seen a lot of his work. That's just one of the many posters he's done, the stamps he's uh, been commissioned to do for NASA, and plus emblems. And he's working even as we speak. Bob, can we say good morning? Bob McCall, can you hear me? Well, there's a busy man. He's not listening. He's looking at his watch. And he's painting and uh, uh, doesn't hear what I'm saying. He has seen, I don't, uh, countless launches. And he has uh, painted and sketched the astronauts. And I don't know whether it's space that inspires this man or astronauts. Maybe a little bit later we can get back to Bob McCall. I'd like to ask him for one thing, if, uh, if astronaut Sally Ride is, has his heroic a figure to him as some of the original astronauts were when he was first so taken. And you can see what he's working on. What's he doing? Is that in watercolors? Well, we'll see more of that a little bit later. Dick, how you, um, how'd you get taken by the space program? I don't know if, if the rest of us can explain what made our hearts rush, but you're a pilot. Well, it was basically a natural progression from what I was, I was a test pilot at Edwards Air Force Base in California, and it was a natural progression from what I was doing into what I'm doing now, and it was just kind of a nice thing. When do you get a ride on the uh, orbit? Flight 13, which is supposed to go next April. How much do you know? I think a little bit later when we get closer, I'm going to ask you specifically what's going to be happening. I'm going to ask you questions like, what's it feel like? 
and you're going to give me answers. I'm going to give you answers, but this is going to be based on crew debriefings and simulations that I've been in, not on actually have, having flown. So the realism, I don't have the realism that somebody's flown has to give Do you, you have to that. experience it, or can NASA simulate fairly accurately the sights and the sounds and the and the shivers and shakes? According to the crews, the, the simulation we have is very good. It does a, a nice job of simulating what goes on, but like in any simulation, there are a lot of things that you can't do really ac real accurately, and so it has some shortcomings, but uh, I think that you have to have been there and done something like that to have a really good feeling for what goes on. The description you get most often coming back, is this moment a little frightening even for the trained experts, or is it just a thrill? I don't know. It's, I don't think frightening is the word. I think it, you're, you end up with a little apprehension any time you're going to do something like this. If somebody's going to light a six-and-a-half million pound candle under you and, and send you off into space, it's, uh, it's got to be exciting. But there's some apprehension involved. And I think the apprehension is that, that uh, you don't want to fail yourself or the program or anything else, so you want to do everything right. And if something goes wrong during the ascent or something like that, that, that you perform correctly and do everything you're supposed to do. 